You know, we, we sang a song today about revival, and uh, I was praying for you today, and the Lord reminded me that revival is a great thing, and sometimes revival happens, and we pray for it, and then we reject it because we don't like what it looks like, because it's different, and God restores things, and he brings in people that make us uncomfortable. But as I prayed for you, God is stirring my heart that in our church, revival is a great thing, but we need a reformation, a reforming of our hearts around what is right and what is true. Because we, we set our hearts, we set our desires on things of this world, or we, we take good things that God made, and instead of just seeing those things as good gifts, we begin to worship the gifts rather than the gift giver. And we need a reformation in our hearts to say, God, let your word be as it says, that it's a double-edged sword, and let it cut and penetrate and cut apart my heart until it looks more like you. Amen? I'm praying for us today. God, would you give us a reformation? Come on, put your hand on your heart if you're here and you want to receive from the Lord today. God, give us a reforming of our hearts. God, a reforming of our very nature today. Let us let go of what we think we know to lay hold of what is true and what is right according to your word. God, I ask that you would speak to your people today, that you'd meet us where we are, and God, there'd be a reformation in our hearts and in our communities and in our nation, one that is, is founded and grounded in your word. We ask this in Jesus' name, and the church said, amen, amen. amen. Go ahead and be seated, everybody. Thanks for being here today. You are awesome, and you are parked all over this property, <laughs> trying to fit your car in. I want to remind you, we have a 12:30 service with more seats if you don't like being crowded in. But we're grateful that you've made do. We're excited for more parking coming this summer, and we'll continue to work on that issue in the days and years that are ahead. It is almost that spring graduation, late cabin kind of season. And so I want to give you a few things uh, just to look forward to this summer. We do have midweek this week. I have not been so excited and scared about a midweek, uh, maybe in my life, but we are actually, we're going to dig into God's Word in a different kind of way. I've asked a group of pastors to be on stage with me, and we're going to teach through the Old Testament, and we're going to talk about how to read through the Old Testament and give it meaning for today. Many of us read the first 39 books of the Bible and think that is weird, that doesn't always sound like the God that I think I knew. I don't know how that fits into scripture. I skip this book because it's a lot of weird stuff in it. And how do we fit the, the Old Testament into history, but ultimately, how do we see Jesus in the Old Testament? And how is it a part of God's master plan for his people? So bring your notebook, you can bring your computer and take notes and be a part. You're gonna read the Old Testament different after Wednesday if you come uh, to midweek or you join us online. We're here at the Bismarck campus, gonna have midweek, excited for that. Uh, also wanna let you know that if you're one of our dream teamers, you received an email about heart and soul and we're kicking off a pilot group just for dream teamers. So yeah, you get special treatment if you serve the house. And uh, we're inviting you to heart and soul. So if you've not responded to that, come and be a part of it. Just check your email. Want to let you know this week we're hosting pastors from all across our region. I'm asking you to pray for us. Uh, pray for pastors. The work of ministry um, and the work of leading people is sometimes an arduous one. And we want to see pastors come in, be encouraged. New pastors commissioned and sent out. Um, because God gives leaders to the church, and it's our job to commission them. We're going to be in part of encouraging them and equipping them this week, and so pray for us as we do that. Also, Mother's Day is just around the corner in a couple of weeks, so guys, this is your shot over the bow uh, that it's coming, and to be ready, we honor all the women of our church on Mother's Day because we know there's physical mothers, but also spiritual mothers, and also women desiring to have children, and so we want to include everybody uh, in celebrating that day. And then lastly, on June 9th, I want you to know that John Bevere will be here. He'll be speaking at all of our services if you're familiar with him. Uh, or if you're not, his book is available in Joy House. You can grab it. Uh, I think it's called The Awe of God. And I uh, want you to be a part of what he's gonna speak into the life of our church on that weekend. It's gonna be an awesome season. Great season of ministry. And it's almost summer, so there's that. If you were to walk into um, a museum and view one of the great works of art that 
maybe were composed by somebody like da Vinci. You would walk into that place, you'd stand behind probably the little roped off area, you would look at that image, and you would begin to process and to take in something like the Mona Lisa. You would look at the meaning behind it, you would think of the hours and hours of work that went in to make it into the masterpiece that it is. You would take in that image and, and try to understand what is it about this painting that has captured the imagination and the attention of people all over the world throughout different periods of time. You would try to see in it what is so valuable and so important that it's worth so much and that so many people have found mystery and meaning with this created thing. You would look at it and if somebody walked by and said, I don't think that's actually a painting, I think that's just a poster that somebody printed and put up and we're all being deceived. You would be insulted. You would find that to be a huge injustice to the time that da Vinci or whatever other artist whose work you were taking in had put in to that creation. And you would desire to know more about it. Beyond the work of human hands, there is a work that carries the same kind of mystery and masterpiece that was composed over time and ages and through different people that deserves our looking into far more than any painting of a created being. And it's this creation called the Word of God, the Bible, the Scripture, written over the course of 1,500 years by 40 different authors, some kings, others military leaders, and then some peasants and fishermen and poets and tax collectors, some philosophers, all writing from different places, some in the wilderness and others in the dungeon, some in palaces and some in prison, some on hillsides and some along the roads and others even in caves. Written in three different languages, Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek, across three different continents, written by rich and poor, educated and uneducated, young and old, addressing a variety of topics, some controversial but all cohesive in their meaning, topics like marriage and divorce and homosexuality and adultery and how to honor authority and taxes and revelations of God himself. And doing so with overwhelming harmony, despite the diversity of the subjects addressed and those that written, wrote it in their different social classes and time frames that they lived. Can you imagine 40 authors in all these different places and from all these different history, try taking any cohesive work and getting 40 people in this room to agree on it. <laughs> how much more the word of God in the diversity of how it was created and how it was put together. It's worth looking into. In fact, in the Bible, it says this, that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching. It's useful for rebuking. It's useful for correcting. It's useful for training in righteousness. It's not just words on a page. It's not just a historical document, though it is reliably historical that when you use textual criticism and compare it to other works of history that have been carried through time, there's far more declaring that the Bible is true than even some of the other historical documents that we work about. Maybe even all of them. And it's useful because it's God-breathed. It is the, the words of God. It's, it's Jesus Christ in the flesh coming as the word of God as written about in John. It's not words like your favorite book that maybe pass away with time or become a little bit less relevant or need to be amended to fit the modern day. It's like God. It's his word. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's the word of God in that the heavens and the earth will all pass away, but God's word will remain forever. It's a, a word that is just as relevant today as it was when 
a shepherd like David was writing it than David the king when he spoke into it. It's just as relevant to our time as it was to theirs, and it's still useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. Why? So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Come on, does anybody want to be thoroughly equipped for every good work that God has prepared in advance for us to do? Today, I want to give you a message entitled, God's Word is Truth. God's word is truth. Surveys today in the census regularly tell us that approximately up to 63% of our nation is Christian. That when asked uh, to check a box on spiritual foundation or belief or even socially where you gather in your religious circles, that up to 63% of people, that's 210 Americans out of about 330 million would profess or proclaim to be Christian if asked to on paper. But we know that our call is not to a label or a religious circle or just to what religion we would put on a census. But our call is the call of Jesus that says, take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. What is Jesus saying when he talks about the yoke that we're meant to take? He's saying like when you find an author that you really like and you have to read every single thing that that person has ever written. It's like you love C.S. Lewis, so you'll read all of Narnia and all of his other books because you love the way that he teaches. It's taking the teaching of a person and it's putting that teaching upon yourself and applying it to your life. It's becoming a disciple of that person, following and living in the way that they lived. And it's not a matter of if we do this, it's it's that we do this with people. And whose yoke is it that you're taking on? Who are you listening to? Who are you following? I was disturbed this week as division broke out in the church in our nation and to see how many people carry social media influences so they think that they have godly authority. Because thousands or hundreds of thousands of people look to their opinion, they believe that they have the authority to speak on what is God and what is not. Can I remind you that influence is one thing and it comes from man, but spiritual authority is a different thing and it comes from God. And we should be careful not to confuse the two. We often long and seek influence from people, but I believe we're called to be followers of Jesus who take the yoke and the teaching of Jesus and put it on our own shoulders and carry it and follow the Lord Jesus Christ despite what it does to our influence. Why? Because we're living for an audience of one. And his spiritual authority goes farther in his kingdom than our influence with man. It's likely the number of true convictional Christians in America who are actually being discipled in the teachings of Christ Jesus is more like 4%, not 63, which is actually about 13 million people, which means we have a lot of Christians socially, but not many disciples of Jesus convictionally. If this is the way that we live, then it's a little bit like what I did this week when I got something new that we needed for our home, a little piece of Ikea furniture or something that you picked up at the store and you decide to put it together. And if you're like me, you're like, I don't need directions. (laughs) It's very clear this goes there and that goes there. And I started to put it together and I was literally two pieces in when I realized that I'd put it together backwards. So I'm quickly trying to take it apart so that my family and my wife don't notice that I put it in backwards to protect my pride and my ego. Because I should know how to put this together. It's fairly simple. There were only about 10 pieces. (laughs) And when we live life and we think, you know what, I don't need to know how this should go. I can figure it out on my own. I'm capable. I know best. It's the same thing that we're doing when we take 
the word of God, his instruction manual, the word that says, thy word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path, and we set it on the shelf and we think I can figure this out on my own. And so you get a generation and a society that says, my truth is my truth. My truth comes from within me, not from anywhere else. We've set aside the instruction manual, and so of course we'll get things backwards. We'll call what's wrong right and what's right wrong, and we'll miss the mark according to our own opinions. We are filled with a world full of opinions, but very few people actually know what they're talking about. They're just representing what they feel, and when we listen more to their opinions and their thoughts than to God's word, then we are what the Bible calls deceived. We've missed the mark. Our, our theology and our doctrine and our understanding of God is more informed by the culture than it is by the masterpiece of his word. It's more informed by those things than it is by those who actually walked with Jesus and wrote down the things that he said and the things that he did. And so we get our lives backwards because we fail to follow the instructions. Did you see what the scripture said? So that every believer will be thoroughly equipped. Every follower of Jesus will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So here's my question that I have for you today. Do we believe that the Bible is divinely inspired? And if so, do we treat it with appropriate authority in our lives? Do we believe that the Bible is divinely inspired by God? And if so, do we live according to it in such a way that we give it appropriate authority in our lives. See, God wrote the Bible, and maybe people say, well, how did that happen? How did God write the scripture? Well, God built the scripture in the same way that he built everything else in his kingdom. God sent his only son to the earth, Jesus Christ, who was what? 100% God and 100% human. God built his church on the earth, which we know that we are the body of Christ. We're the bride of Christ that he's returning for, but Christ Jesus is the head of our church. What does that make the church on the earth? 100% human, but with Christ as our head, we're 100% Christ. God's word is the same way. It's 100% God in that it was inspired by him. He instructed people as they wrote down the words that we find in it, but they were, they were carried along by the Holy Spirit as they wrote. So the Bible is 100% God and 100% human. It's the way of God's kingdom that he chooses to use people to accomplish his work. It's the same as the scripture that we read, that it, us being thoroughly equipped for every good work is 100% God's work in our life and partnership with him, but we have to, in fact, partner with him. It's 100% human. It depends on our obedience. This scripture that we hold today is affirmed by Jesus, who was God. In fact, in, Genesis, in, in Matthew 5, Jesus affirmed that all the scripture that came before him, right, there was all the Old Testament, the first 39 books of the Bible were spoken and they were written and then Jesus comes 400 years later. And Jesus affirms that all those things that have been written down are scripture. They are the word of God, not just the word of people, not a historical document, not just nice encouraging words on a page, not Chinese proverbs. They are the word of God. Jesus also, in John 16, affirmed all the scripture that would come. You know, because when Jesus was walking the earth, they were still writing down the things that he was doing. The, the record of the acts and the epistles or letters to the churches written by Paul that we read about hadn't been written yet. But Jesus, in advance, affirms that the scripture that would be to come would also be the word of God. And so in that, we believe that the Bible is divinely inspired. That though written by humans, it is 100% God's word to his creation. We believe that Jesus, as John 1 says, he was the word of God in the flesh. That Jesus came and lived a perfect life. He was the word of God incarnate or in human form. See, there's many historical documents and even books that claim to be biblical. But the Bible is unique, why? Because like I've already said, it's divinely inspired. There's many religions 
There's many Bible-based cults that come from somebody taking the word of God, having what they call an additional revelation to it, and calling that scripture. It's the visions and the writings of Joseph Smith in Mormonism. It's the teachings of Muhammad in Islam. An additional revelation. But the Bible tells us that there will be many people who say that they are Christ in the last days and they aren't. There will be many deceiving spirits who proclaim to be from God, but they're not. There will even be angels of light that we want to follow and think that sounds spiritual, that sounds like Jesus, but it's not Christ. It's not biblical. In fact, for some of us today, you were raised with additional books in your Bible called the Apocrypha. They're a part of the Catholic Bible. And though those books of the Bible are historically helpful, they were rejected by Jesus, by the disciples, by the early Jews, and by the early church as not being inspired by God. Well, what about this book that they recently found that from this prophet or this person, should that have been in the Bible? No, they, the early Jewish leaders, the early church, Christ himself and the disciples all spoke to what actually belonged in scripture. And what you'll see in a moment is even the disciples affirmed one another's writings to be included in the scripture. Jesus, his disciples, the Jewish leaders, the Jewish community, all say that the Here's the process. The process of deciding what's in the scripture is called the canon. That's one N, C-A-N-O-N. Or the canonization of scripture. And the Jewish circles, the Jewish leaders, Jesus, his disciples, all talk about a canon that was closed regarding the Old Testament after the last historical events that we read in the first 39 books of the Bible, which are the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther. They all speak to a canon that is closed after the last historical prophet spoke, which were Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. We get other writings historically that have been included in the Apocrypha and other places that happen after those writings. In the 400 years between those writings and the coming of Christ. But the, the, old, the old Testament speaks to the, the reality, and Jesus believed this, and the disciples believed this, that after those last historical events, and after those last prophets, that the Holy Spirit departed from Israel, and there was silence. That God wasn't speaking. That the things that were written during that time were not divinely inspired. In fact, Josephus, who was a contemporary after the death of Christ, he He wrote about this and he said, from Artaxerxes or Esther's time to our own times, a complete history has been written, but it has not been deemed worthy of equal credit with earlier records because of the failure of the exact succession of the prophets. It wasn't written by people who were hearing from God the inspired word of God. How do we know? Because all the prophets up to Haggai and Malachi, all the minor prophets, what were they saying? They were saying we're now in the time where we're waiting for a new prophet to arise. We're in the time where we're waiting for the Christ who has been prophesied about to be revealed. We're waiting on Messiah. And how many of you are grateful that though God went silent for 400 years after that, After those 400 years, there were still people of God who had not ever heard the voice of God who were in the temple waiting on him to speak again. Come on, we pray and we think, God, where are you? I asked you, why didn't you respond? God, are you even a part of my life anymore? God, do you even speak anymore today because God has been quiet for 30 seconds? 400 years. And still they were faithful and they were in the temple to receive Jesus when he came. What's the good news? That even if God has been silent in your your life recently, at any moment he can show up and begin to speak again. At any moment. That means that the faithfulness on our part has to rely on the faithfulness on his part and trust him even when we can't see him and when we can't hear him. Jesus and the New Testament authors quote various parts of the Old Testament scriptures as accepted by the Jewish community over 295 times in the New Testament. They do not quote the books of the Apocrypha or any writings in those 400 years of silence even once. Really, the Old Testament was accepted by Jesus and his disciples and the Jewish leaders at the time. So then the question becomes, who decided 
what was divinely inspired and what was not. Who decided what goes in here and what does not? I told you already, there's a process called the canon. I've talked to you about how that worked in the, in the Old Testament, but really for a book to be included in the Bible, it had to meet three criteria. It had to be written by an apostle or somebody who had actually walked with Jesus or somebody connected to someone who had walked with Jesus. Somebody with credibility had to have written it, specifically in the New Testament. It had to meet the criteria that it was consistent with the other scriptures, that it didn't contradict itself, that it was consistent in that it didn't create theological dilemmas. And when read, it had to have the effect of people reading it and having the sense that this is God-breathed writing. This is God-inspired writing. And in the New Testament, you know, in the, the second half of the Bible, the 27 books of the New Testament, what's happening is that all creation is waiting for the revealing of the Messiah, the revealing of Christ Jesus. It's God's love story. It's God's restoration story for his people. That's really what the Bible is. It, it captures God's perfect creation at Eden, our fall from that creation, and God's work to restore his people back into perfect Eden relationship uh, in the end, which is where we're headed in heaven and the new heavens and the new earth. It's all contained in this book, God's master plan of salvation and restoring his people. And so all the Old Testament points to this waiting for Messiah to come and finally in a manger, a baby is born and it becomes apparent to shepherds and to others that the Messiah has come. It becomes apparent to those who had been waiting in the temple, Simeon and Anna, that the Messiah had come. Soon it becomes apparent to the people around Israel that this rabbi, this prophet Jesus is not just a prophet, he's not just a teacher, but he's God in the flesh. That's why we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we read about what Jesus did, and all of a sudden crowds begin to follow him because they begin to realize this is no ordinary rabbi. This is no ordinary teacher. This is no prophet alone. This man is who he says he is, and he is the son of the living God. This Jesus was before Abraham was and before Moses was. He is God in the flesh. He's the word of God revealed to humanity. And so they begin to write it down. And I don't know, maybe you've had the thought, like, how did these disciples actually remember everything Jesus said? You know, like, you're, you're, you're hearing an inspiring like leadership talk or something and you think, that's so good, I have to write that down. No, 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 I'll remember, right? And then a half hour later, you're like, Phew. So if that's how we are, how did the disciples remember? Well, this is the God part. In John 14, 26, Jesus says, I'm going to bring to your memory all that I've said. You're gonna sit down to write at the human part and the God part is gonna kick in and I'm gonna to bring to your memory all that I've said. In John 16, Jesus said that his spirit would guide us into all truth. That he was, he was orchestrating behind the scenes a divinely written and divinely inspired work of God. And so pretty soon these books begin to get authored by those who walked with Jesus and those who encountered Jesus and that's what made the New Testament books eligible to be entered into scripture. In fact, the disciple Peter, who had walked with Jesus, had loved Jesus, had been rebuked by Jesus, the word of God literally rebuked him, corrected him, trained him for righteousness, Jesus in the flesh, begins to write about the works of the apostle Paul, who wasn't one of the original disciples, but had encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus, and Peter looks at what Paul is writing to the early church, and Every once in a while, Peter and Paul affirmed one another. At other times, they disagreed with each other and rebuked each other. But Peter sees what Paul is writing to the churches, and he says that Paul's writings should be willing to be accepted as Scripture. That's the word that the disciples and others would use for this is the words of God. Paul reads about what Luke is writing about the gospel of Jesus and the life that Jesus lived, and as Paul reads it, he says, Luke's writings are scripture. They are the, the divinely inspired word of God. 
So in our New Testament, the last 27 books of the Bible, we find that Matthew and John and Romans to Philemon, all those books that Paul wrote, and James and First and Second Peter and First through Third John and the book of Revelation, all are divinely authored based on the fact that apostles wrote them. There's other books not written by apostles, but by those in close, close proximity to them that are also included, like Mark and Luke and the book of Acts and Hebrews and, and Jude. They were accepted based on close association with the apostles. The disciples would have vouched for them and said, this is the word of God. And in AD 367, some 300 years after Jesus died, all the churches in the Eastern Mediterranean world got together and said, these books in the Old Testament and these in the New written by the apostles, these are authoritatively and conclusively divinely inspired. This is the word of God. And 30 years later, the churches in the Western Mediterranean world got together at another council and said, we affirm what the other churches said. This is the inspired word of God. And so it was all but settled before 400 AD that the 66 books of this Bible were the word of God. The Apocrypha was added some thousand years later out of fear of the Reformation. This is the word of God. This is the inspired word of God written by human hands under the unction and the leading of Holy Spirit himself. It's our problem in America is that something becomes so common that we fail to see its value. If there were a thousand Mona Lisas that da Vinci did and you could pretty much access one anywhere, it would seem less valuable. But if he had put all the hours into each one of those thousand pieces, it would still maintain value. God's word simply, not just be, because it's so accessible to you, the danger in your life is that it becomes common. And every new voice that rises up on social media, every new voice that rises up with a new teaching, every new voice that declares to have some additional revelation is gonna to begin to look attractive because you've set down the guide and you're simply walking according to your own understanding. Today, there exists no book or no writing in addition to what was concluded in the canon there's no strong objections that anything else should be included or anything in here should be excluded. And so, if the Bible is divinely inspired and authored, then it should carry divine authority in our lives. My job is to stand here and to create dissonance in your heart if this is not the way that you're living. But it's the job of the Holy Spirit to show you what is right and to teach you how to live. So if the Bible is the word of God, and I'm calling you to choose, is it inspired? Did God say it? In the same way that I would call you to choose about Christ Jesus, was he the son of the living God? And here's my challenge to you. If he was not, and if this is not his word, then how does it so cohesively come together across 1,500 years with 40 different authors across every different section and sector of society conclusively? And why were the people who contributed to writing it willing to die by the sword because they so convictionally believed that it was true? People will perpetuate a lie, but not many people will die for one. And they were willing to give their lives saying, Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the son of the living God, and this is his word. And they elevated it to a place where they lived under its authority. The difference in our society between people who carry the label Christian and then live however they want is that others who truly follow Jesus have taken the yoke of his teaching upon their lives, even the parts they don't fully understand, even the parts they wanna argue with, and they've said, I wanna become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. I wanna take his teaching and his yoke upon me because his burden is easy and his yoke is light. And there is a rest Hebrews says there is a rest for God's people. 
that comes by living according to his word. If the Bible is divinely authored, then it carries divine authority in every one of our lives. That means that it is a higher standard of truth than any other truth. The world will tell you to speak your truth, that, that the highest level of truth is according to whatever you feel and whatever comes from within you and your experience in life. The difficulty of that is that when, every, when truth is relevant to whatever's on the inside of each individual person, you can have no universal right and wrong. Because what's right to you will be wrong to somebody else, and what's wrong to somebody else may be right to you. So how, how can you take even the most bizarrely wrong things in our society and call them wrong when truth is according to what you feel? And truth is according to whatever comes from within you and your ability to express that. It's actually a conflict. We don't believe that truth comes from within. We believe that truth comes from the word of God. And when you get in it, it will get inside of you. And it will transform you. There are millions of voices I've said it before, but you can go on YouTube, you can go on Google, you can get in the comments of social media, and you can find somebody to massage your perverted beliefs about the world and about the gospel. But God's truth is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. This is a gift. This is a gift. Because in Hebrews 4, he says, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active. You read these words and sometimes you read something and it seems to mean nothing to you and other times you read it and it jumps off the page, jumps into your soul and begins to cut away at your heart. It is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Come on, how many of you know that you were in an argument, you were in a disagreement, you had a thought or a belief about something and you were sure that you were right. You went into your prayer closet, you opened the word of God and you came out realizing that you needed to repent, that you had missed the mark, that you had fallen short. If no person and no truth has the ability to rebuke you, you're deceived. Verse 13, and no creature is hidden from God's sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. His word is truth. And that means that it has to be elevated in our lives as a higher truth than any other form of truth. It is more than words on a page. It demands full submission and full acceptance. We don't get to reject the parts that we don't like. We don't get to neglect the parts that we don't understand. We don't get to choose what is relevant for today. But God's word is enduring. It's like God. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And even when the opinions of the world and the society will change like the shifting winds, God's word will remain the same and it sets the standard for how we live and here's the good part it is self-attesting and it's truthful when it says in John 8 32 you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free what's this all about pastor Josh said I gotta read my bible more pastor Josh said I can't be on social media pastor Josh this is an issue of freedom, of a soul that is truly, by coming in surrender to God and his word, truly living free, entering into the rest that God gives for the human soul. It's an issue because many of us take parts of God's word and don't accept others and so we live trying to live according to some of the rules but never fully experiencing the promises of God that come with obedience. 
we're enslaved to trying to live out parts of God's word, but not being obedient enough to experience the fullness of his promises. But you will know the truth. I declare that over you today. You will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. If you were to look at Mona Lisa today, there would be a certain level of awe and inspiration but it pales in comparison to the masterpiece of scripture. And the beautiful thing about scripture is whether you open to Genesis or Revelation or anywhere in the middle, the Bible is a cohesive story written across 1500 years, 40 different authors. It, it, It affirms itself. It would be an impossible thing to write a story that perfectly cohesive about divine mysteries like the scripture. But I wanted to show you an image today that helps us to understand just what a masterpiece the scripture is in that it shows all the different times that the Bible affirms itself. From Old Testament to New Testament, New Testament to New Testament, Old Testament to Old Testament, across the course of the scripture. These are all the verses of the Bible that interact and confirm one another, making it cohesive, affirming itself, telling the story of God's lost and broken creation, his people that he made in his image, and his will and desire to restore them back to himself. It's his master plan of salvation. That is a masterpiece. That for God so loved the world, that from Eden to Eden, he put together a story of salvation for his people. God so loved you, that he could have just done it. But over and over and over and over and over again, he worked that plan for your good. So that without a shadow of a doubt, I would know that the day that I leave this world, I will be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ because God's promises are true and they are good. And he's given me his word as a lamp to my feet and a light from my path, amen? Here's your application. Get the word of God inside of you. Because when it gets inside of you, it will change you. How does a young man keep his way pure, the psalmist writes? By living according to God's word. He has all that you need and he's given you this gift. Can we stand under the authority of God's word together? Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word in the form of your son, Jesus. We thank you for the gift of your written word. We thank you that you're still a God who is speaking today by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, if we have been in rebellion to your word and your plan right now, Lord, we ask you to transform our thinking. We turn from our wicked ways. And Lord, as we open your word, we ask that it would come alive, that it would be like a double-edged sword that cuts away the ways that we shouldn't live and reveals the new ways that we ought to live. Lord, that when your word is on our mouths, that it would be like a honey sweet to our soul, that it would be good. But also that as it flows from us, God, it would bring life to every place that it touches. That it would bring hope even to the darkest situations. And we thank you that in your word, you say that you sent your only son, Jesus, to die for our sins. And today we accept his sacrifice and his forgiveness. And we ask that the word of God who became flesh and made his dwelling among us would now make his dwelling in us. And you would bring us out of our darkness and into your marvelous light. God, we thank you for your word. We honor it today. And we ask that it would reform our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, amen. Amen. Come on, will you lift up your hands and lift up your voices? Can we give him our worship today? Thank you.